This is Friday, November 10, 2017. We are in Natick, Massachusetts, and this tape is part of the Morris Institute Library's continuing Veterans Oral History Project. My name is Maureen Sullivan. Our cameraman is Dan McDermott of Natick Pegasus, and we are privileged to have with us today David Hawkman. Welcome, Dave. Thank you. May I ask when you were born? August of 1943. And where were you born? Cambridge, Massachusetts. And where do you currently live? Situate. Your marital status? Married. Do you have children? Four of them. Grandchildren? Eleven of them. Great. One. Congratulations. Tell us a bit about Cambridge growing up. Oh, Cambridge was Cambridge was a great city mm -hmm. at that time. Uh, lots of kids. Mm -hmm. Everybody would stay out in the streets till the lights came on. Mm -hmm. Our parents always knew where to find us. Down at the park. Mm -hmm. The only thing that changed was the ball we hit. And uh, what part of Cambridge? Uh, Huron Avenue, Observatory Hill. Mm -hmm. And did uh, what did your dad do for a living? He was a school teacher, ultimately the deputy superintendent of the schools in Cambridge. And was he a veteran? He was indeed. And United what? States Air Force, served uh, in the Second World War in the Philippines and Australia. And what did your mother do? Uh, my mother stayed at home and with, five, with five kids. She had to. All right. And did you go to school in Cambridge? I did, Cambridge High and Latin. Mm -hmm. And during the time you were attending Cambridge Ridge and Latin, were you made aware of events happening outside the city, such as uh, Russia, the Cold War, Vietnam? Of course. Mm -hmm. What were you being told? Interesting. Um, I would say that we, told, we heard very little about Russia other than that they were the bad guys. Mm -hmm. uh, Vietnam really didn't exist on my radar while I was in high school or on anybody's radar. I graduated in 1961. And what did you do after graduation? I went to college. And where'd you go to college? Harvard. Well, that's a good commute. Yeah, well, it was a tough commute. I only wound up going to Harvard because it was cheaper than going to Northeastern. And what did you uh, study at Harvard? Uh, majored in economics. And did you graduate from Harvard? Yes, I did. In what year? 1967. It took a while. Tough courses or? No, it wasn't. The courses were tough. Uh huh. Did uh, Uncle Sam come a knocking? Almost a day after I graduated. Oh, my goodness. 1967 was a big year. Mm -hmm. Graduated, got married, got drafted. In that order. Okay, you got drafted, and what branch uh, did you go into? What branch selected me? Yes. The Army. The Army. You didn't select the Army, the Army selected you. Absolutely. <laughs> okay, so you're newly married with a bachelor's degree in economics. You got the letter from Uncle Sam. Tell us uh, what happened. Uh, when were you formally inducted? Formally inducted? Mm -hmm. uh, September of 1967. Well, so much for the summer of love for you. Well, the day before I was inducted, I was sitting on the Canadian border wondering where to go. Wow. <laughs> but you decided to head back south. I did. And where did you go for basic? Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Was this the first time you were away from home? 
Yeah, for the most part. So when you're in Fort Jackson, South Carolina, kind of a different climate, is this the first time you were meeting, aside from going to Harvard, meeting folks from other parts of the country? Yeah, mm. yeah. Tell us a bit about BASIC. You, beyond the fact that it sucked? <laughs> All righty, go ahead. <laughs> uh, well, the conditioning part of it was great. Uh huh. But the Army was geared up to deal with a, a 17 or 18 year old kid. I was 24. Mm -hmm. uh, I learned right away that you can go anywhere on an Army base as long as you carry a clipboard and some papers. And the police call is a very simple thing to do as long as you maintain your own cigarette butts. And how long were you uh, at uh, South Carolina? Uh, the basic, I think, eight weeks. Eight weeks? Yeah. And were you given any additional testing or training? You mean, a yeah, AIT. AIT, and yeah. what does that stand for? Advanced, Advanced Infant. infant it, yeah, advanced training, really. Okay. It's a, the, second, the second leg of basic. Uh -huh. You have a bachelor's degree in economics. Didn't the Army like that? Oh, they loved it. Uh, mm -hmm. They offered me the opportunity to fly a helicopter or to uh, enlist for four years and be an officer, both of which I declined. But they were very happy that I had geometry in high school. Mm -hmm. And why were they so happy you had geometry in high school? That was the difference between infantry and artillery. Okay. You stay uh, because of geometry. You stayed in the infantry. I stayed in stayed in artillery. Oh, oh artillery. Okay. All right, artillery. <coughs> Excuse me. So what kind of training were you receiving in artillery? Uh, we were, I was trained for, for, uh, to operate a 105 millimeter howitzer. Now were you still in South Carolina at the time? No. 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 Advanced training was at uh, Fort Sill, Oklahoma. Another lovely place to spend your time. I've, I've seen pictures, yeah, it's, uh, it's flat. It's desolate. <laughs> it's desolate. <laughs> and how long were you uh, stationed at Fort Sill? Uh, AIT lasted another eight weeks. Okay. So I did the, did the you know, the mandatory minimum. Mm -hmm. And what was it, uh, what was special about a 105 millimeter howitzer? Uh, nothing, nothing really special about it, except mm -hmm. that you had to be within about four clicks of whatever whatever was going on at the time. Mm -hmm. At a five kilometer range. Okay. Tell us what happened after Fort Sill. <laughs> what happened to everybody? I take it you were sent. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yes. 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 So this gets us into early 1968? Yeah, I got in country right after, right at the end of the Tet Offensive. Okay. And where were, uh, where were you stationed in Vietnam? Uh, it was the 25th Division out of Cu Chi, Da Chang, and Tay Ninh. We were based in Tay Ninh. And could you spell that, please? T A Y. N I N H. And where in South Vietnam where is that located? Uh, near the Cambodian border. So you're really in country. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And what was your assignment? Uh, initially, mm -hmm. gun crew. Mm -hmm. And what was your rank at the time? PFC.
Okay, you're in, you're close to the Cambodian border, you're on a gun crew, you're trained to do, uh, to fire a 105 millimeter howitzer. Let's talk a little bit about being in Vietnam. Uh, what was that like, uh, the weather? <laughs> the weather? Unrelentingly hot. <laughs> what was the clothing you were wearing? Same as everybody wore, fatigues. Mm -hmm. Fatigues. And what about um, provisions? Were you, uh, like K rations, C uh, rations? Well, C's were available anywhere. Mm -hmm. And when, when, whenever we were on the base, it was a mess hall, so that we had a wide selection of mystery meats. <laughs> well, one of my previous interviews uh, was on a swift boat, and but they would sometimes trade uh, stuff with the local villagers for bread. And apparently it was the best bread he ever had because when the French were occupying what was then Indochina, oh, yeah. the locals learned how to bake bread. <laughs> Everybody knew how to do that. Most, most of the Vietnamese knew how to speak French. Did you? Of course not. <laughs> I cleverly, cleverly took German in college. Well, you could have been stationed in Germany. You never know. <laughs> oh, there was no doubt about where you were going mm -hmm. <laughs> at that time. Now, tell us about, uh, did you see action with the enemy? Uh, not really. Not really? Not really. Like anybody else, we got hit with rocket attacks and mortars and mm -hmm. a few sniper rounds. but. And what about in case you were wounded? Uh, was there medical care available? Yes, there, there, was a, there was a hospital on the base. And Dave, did you have a chance to write home to your folks? Your oh, siblings? yeah. 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 You know, I did it very infrequently, but mm -hmm. I was. And what about recreation? Uh, any shows, any chance to see a movie? Not really. Books? Not really. No. Did a lot of reading. Mm -hmm. And how did you uh, keep up with news of the world? It was a little difficult, mm -hmm. but the Army Times would cover a few of the events with a slightly, well. slightly slanted approach to it, but I mean, 68 was a rocking year, as you well know. <laughs> oh. <laughs> and how long were you stationed out there? Out there? Yeah. The, the whole mandatory year. Okay. But I was there for about five months when okay. someone asked me if I knew how to type. And I said, of course. <laughs> so I became the battery clerk, XPFC Wintergreen. Dave, uh, before we get you uh, at battery clerk, is there anything, uh, any stories you remember from your time at that part of Vietnam? Oh, my favorite story. Mm -hmm. is the reason I wear two hearing aids at the moment. Um, we were doing, we were firing at night, and I was, I'd been in country maybe, maybe th two or three months, and was loading ammunition. We're firing away, and apparently they swung the gun around, and I didn't notice. And I was walking under it when it went off, Well, it gets better. It gets better. <laughs> then we started getting incoming fire from uh, rockets and mortars. And I was deaf. I heard nothing. One of the other guys on the gun crew had to come out and tackle me and drag me back into the bunker. And I was deaf for three days. 
It was like a physical blow when that thing went off. And you're still wearing the hearing aids. <laughs> well, yeah, that developed over a few years. Okay. Um, let's step back, take a half step back. What, uh, before you went to Vietnam, what was the Army telling you about uh, the locals, the weather? Were you adequately prepared to go to Vietnam? No, nobody was. Mm -hmm. <laughs> And I remember flying into Saigon at, at, at the uh, when I was when I was being brought into Vietnam, and I looked out of the window of the plane. And there's all this black smoke surrounding Vietnam. So I said to myself, "Oh Christ, <laughs> they're blowing the place up." Now this was during Tet. It took a few weeks before I realized that what happened was that every base in, in the area would burn the latrines. So that was your introduction to Vietnam? That was it. I was very happy to learn that it really wasn't <laughs> coming apart at the seams. Yeah, but I understand the, the, the smell was, uh, shall we say, pungent? <laughs> It smelled like diesel fuel. Mm -hmm. And when you were in country, did you did your unit ever interact with the local population? Not really. Okay. Not really. Or or not on not on purpose. Okay. I I can remember one time. Um, fortunately, I wasn't involved in it, but. The battery was back at base camp, and everybody was everybody was having a one, <coughs> wonderful time drinking. Mm -hmm. And I drank enough to want to go to sleep, but the rest of the guys decided they were going into town. So they went off the base, <coughs> walked through an Arvin ambush on the way into town. Those are, those were the good guys, supposedly. Mm -hmm. Um, went in town, walked through the same ambush on the way back. Uh, shows you how well they were thinking. And I remember the next day going with the going with the captain to pull them all out of the uh, the Arvin control. Oh dear. The uh, the Vietnamese had. had decided that what they really needed was protective custody. <laughs> Hopefully they weren't too much the worse for wear. <laughs> oh, they were they were definitely worn. <laughs> uh -huh. Worn around the edges. <laughs> okay. So Aside from dealing with the local population and the weather, were you being warned about some of the, the native animals, flora, fauna, snakes, things like that? Everybody talked about snakes. There was no real warning about them. Mm -hmm. but one, did, one did pay attention to where they might be. Mm -hmm. So for myself, no problem. Mm -hmm. So you were in Vietnam for pretty much the entire year. Mm -hmm. Tell us what happened after the year was up. Well, I got to, I got to spend another couple of months out at uh, Fort Carson, Colorado. And why were you at Fort Carson? Serving out the last few months of my time. Mm -hmm. I managed to get a 90-day drop to go to grad school. So I really only had about three months left. But the Army wasn't about to let you go. Mm -hmm. And what did you do at the, uh, the, in Colorado? Just clerical stuff, okay. nothing, nothing serious. I know it kind of sounds kind of strange, but given 
how much advancement has been made technologically with computers and stuff. You ba were you basically handling a, an electric typewriter, manual typewriter? Oh, it was a manual typewriter at that point, mm -hmm. yeah. And a lot of paperwork. <laughs> a lot. Uh -huh. We were basically reviewing records. Reviewing records? Huh? Yeah. Fort Carson was 5th Division, uh -huh. and we were pulling personnel records and reviewing them, make sure everything was up to date. Okay. And that's what you did for about Absolutely three months. Absolutely boring. <laughs> boring, but at least you weren't facing rocket or mortar fire or snakes. That's true. Mm -hmm. And my wife was with me. That made a big difference, too. Mm -hmm. And we lived off base, which helped. So when were you discharged from the Army? So, uh, no, it was, it was June of 69. Uh, and Dave, what kind of reception did you get uh, as far as, okay, you're, you're a soldier from those who are not soldiers? Nothing memorable, mm -hmm. really. Right. I, wasn't, I wasn't all that proud of being a soldier mm -hmm. it, and just never, never talked about it. Did you move back to Massachusetts? Yep. Okay. Yep. And you mentioned grad school. Where are we going? Uh, Suffolk. And what what was your, going to be your major in grad school? Uh, at the time, that that major was just for uh, secondary education. Okay. Um, at the time you left the Army, what was your rank? E5. And did you take advantage of the GI Bill to go to grad school? I did. Okay. Did you receive any medals or commendations? Nothing beyond the, the basic. Mm -hmm. The Army Commendation Medal, okay. Vietnam Service Medal. Mm -hmm. I wasn't a great troop. <laughs> I was not a happy camper. Well, at least you are out. Yeah. And how long did you uh, stay at Suffolk? Um, spent the summer. Mm -hmm. Taking classes, student teaching. Mm -hmm. And what did you do? And you graduated from Suffolk. Well, it wasn't. A, it was just a. It was sort of an interim program oh, interim to, program. to okay. take somebody who had a college degree and set mm -hmm. them up for secondary education. Okay. What happened after? I never wound up teaching. Okay. But I did get out of the army early. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So uh, tell tell us what happened. Not teaching. <laughs> oh, uh, I ultimately wound up with the job. When, Went to work, worked for a company for 20 years. And what was the name of the company? The company was called Service Master. We provided managerial service to service departments and hospitals. Mm -hmm. And did any of your siblings serve in the military? My brother served. Mm -hmm. Well, one of my brothers. Yeah. He was also in the Army. He was in Korea on the DMC. He probably saw more action than I did. Mm. And how about your children? None of them have been in the military. Mm -hmm. So Dave, being a Vietnam veteran and seeing the overall treatment given to Vietnam veterans when back in the 70s, do you think uh, that the treatment has improved, the attitude's improved? Oh, I'm sure the, the attitude has improved. Mm -hmm. 
I think one of the unfortunate things is that <clears throat> I was dead set against the draft at the, in the 60s. Mm -hmm. But when I look at what's going on, in, on in, in, at the moment in Iraq and Iran and mm -hmm. places like that, I start to wonder if maybe the draft might not be a good idea. Uh, can you elaborate? Sure. Um, the problem seems to be that there's no public outcry against getting into the same situation we were in in Vietnam. Mm -hmm. uh, a no-win war. Nobody seems to care. I mean, in, in, in the 60s, we almost had a revolution. And after I got out, I was part of that, too. Mm -hmm. I, the Vietnam, Vietnam was a tragic mistake. And I believe Iraq was, too. And I didn't come to that realization until, I, until New Year's Eve when we were watching television and I watched some young girl stick a flower down, a, down the barrel of an M16. Mm. And decided that maybe I was on the wrong side of this. Now David, uh, as you know, Ken Burns came out this fall with the documentary series on Vietnam. Watched every bit of it. And what would you think of it? I thought it was excellent, really. Mm -hmm. um, I think the one thing that, that shocked me was that we had two presidents that were more concerned with winning a re-election than maintaining a lost cause. Mm -hmm. David, did you, um, do you ever think about going back to Vietnam? Well, periodically, but mm -hmm. I've always wondered what it would look like without you know, bullet holes and sandbags and concertina wire. Mm. Apparently, in some spots, it's it's quite good. <laughs> well, it was a beautiful, beautiful city. I mean, mm. Saigon was a beautiful city. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> what I saw of it, oh. <laughs> in and out. <laughs> in and out. <laughs> so, David, how important was it for you to serve in the military? Absolutely unimportant. I could certainly have lived without it. And do you have any message for those who might be serving, uh, will be, might be, and serving in the military now, especially those being deployed to Iraq and Afghanistan? I'm not sure the Army has changed, and if they haven't, I would say question. Mm -hmm. David, is there anything else before we wrap this up? Um, I'm sorry, I'm thinking. That's okay. Well, while you're thinking, what's the name of the brother who uh, served in Korea? Donald. Donald? Okay. No, I'm not sure there's a lot of advice. Mm -hmm. I'd say don't go into, don't go into the service mm -hmm. for any reason other than that you've researched it and have a good feeling for what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And before we wrap this up, uh, David, did you uh, ever visit the Vietnam Memorial? Mm -hmm. Yes, I cried. Yes. Mm -hmm. What'd you think? What a, what a tragic waste of life. Yeah. Well, David Hawkman, we thank you so much for coming and taking part in the Native Veterans Oral History Project. Thank you, Maureen. Thank you.